Welcome back everybody. Our last video was on the PT2399 delay and I thought we would build on that by taking a look at another PT2399 circuit but one that is used in a distinctly different way and that is as a chorus. This is the Little Angel Chorus designed by Rick Holt. His handle on the online forums is Frequency Central. And this design is really quite clever because it takes advantage of the internal structure of the PT2399 to allow us to do something that otherwise might not really be possible. And we'll dive into that in a little bit. Um, for this circuit, I'm just going to skip over the power section. It's very similar to what the PT2399 delay had. It's the same requirements. So we're going to jump right into the audio path, which comes in here in the top left-hand side. Now this should look pretty um, familiar by now, this section here. This is our pull-down resistor, input capacitor, and an inverting op-amp gain stage. The gain is being set by the ratio of R11 and R9, which is roughly 2 to 1, so it's approximately a gain of 2. And then we are biasing the positive terminal from our bias voltage through R10 so that we are making sure that our signal is in the center of our two op amp supplies, which is 9 volts and ground. And then C9 is our output capacitor or our DC blocking capacitor going into the PT2399. And before we get into the delay stage, we're going to take a look at the rest of the dry stage, which comes out of our op amp through a 10K resistor. There is a switch here that kills the dry signal because when you kill the dry signal of a chorus, you get kind of a vibrato effect and then it's, it goes through a DC blocking capacitor, there's a pull down resistor here, and it goes to the output. And that takes care of our dry signal. Now we're going to take a look at the delay stage, and this should look pretty familiar. We've got these three resistors and this capacitor, which set up the input filtering to the input of the PT2399. It's set up as a low pass filter so that we don't um, put in lots and lots of high frequency energy. It's at a pretty high corner there. Um, we have the capacitor between pins 9 and 10 and between pins 11 and 12 and the capacitor from pin 8 to ground and pin 7 to ground all doing filtering on the modulator and demodulator um, of the audio internal to the PT2399. That's to get rid of any high frequency hash from the, um, those digital processes on the audio. The output, the delayed output comes out of pin 12 and then we have three more resistors and this cap between pins 13 and 14 that sets up another low pass filter to take off just a little bit of the very highest frequencies. That'll get rid of any digital noise that may have made its way through. And then once that delayed signal comes out there, it goes through a 10K resistor, through a DC blocking capacitor, and right here the signals get passively mixed. Um, normally we would put a summing amplifier here, but in this case, both signals are being driven from a low output impedance source, and our other half of our dual op amp is being used for our LFO, or low frequency oscillator, that we will discuss more in just a little bit. Now, one of the things that really sets this circuit apart is what's happening over here on the right hand side of this PT2399. You'll recall from our last video that changing the resistance from pin 6 to ground changes the amount of current that gets pulled through pin 6, which determines our delay time. However, with the chorus, we want really short delay times, and in order to get the shortest delay time possible, ideally, we would just ground pin 6. 
However, because this is a digital chip, when you first apply power to the system, if this pin is grounded, the chip will actually lock up and you won't get any delayed signal out. So what Rick ended up doing was a very clever um, soft bring up circuit, if you will, that consists of a 2.2K resistor to ground here. But then in parallel with that is a 100 ohm resistor that goes from the collector to emitter of an NPN transistor to ground. And what this does is when we have no voltage applied to the system, so power is off, then there's no voltage here and everything is grounded. But as soon as we apply voltage to the system, this five volts is going to come down through this resistor and it's going to start charging up capacitor C1. But the values of R1 and C1 are going to determine how long it takes to charge up. But once C1 gets charged, then it will eventually come up to our voltage level here. And once we get up to five volts on the base of this transistor, actually it's not even five volts, once we get to um, a certain voltage on the base of this transistor, this transistor goes from looking like an open circuit to a short circuit, which means that after some amount of time, this transistor all of a sudden looks like just a piece of wire going to ground, which means that after this capacitor has charged up, then pin six sees 2.2 kilo ohms in parallel with 100 ohms, which is going to be just a little under 100 ohms, which is going to give us our minimum delay time. But the charging time set by our resistor and capacitor here are going to give the PT2399 just enough time to boot up, if you will, to get all of the internal processes running correctly so that the chip doesn't latch up and then we can put that resistance basically to ground and get our minimum delay time, which is about 30 milliseconds. So that's really clever. Also from the last video, if you remember, we talked about pin two being an analog reference voltage and that this was always at two and a half volts. Well, this two and a half volts reference voltage actually comes into play with helping determine the frequency of the VCO in that if we move this voltage around from two and a half volts, then the VCO actually changes. We're not going to go into this in depth here, but I'll put a link in the description of where you can go to get more information. But suffice it to say that if we wiggle the voltage on pin two by a couple hundred millivolts, we're going to shift the delay time around enough to get a really good chorusing effect. And so um, pin six is essentially going to see just a static resistance to ground and pin two is going to see a time varying voltage. Now in order to wiggle that voltage around, we need something that's going to create a voltage signal that changes slowly in time. And for that, we're going to use what's called a low frequency oscillator or LFO. And that's this portion of the circuit over here that uses one op amp and some passive components. What happens is we supply it with a voltage to one of its terminals. And you'll notice that this VC comes from over here. So it's a voltage divider of 100 K to 4.7 K, which in this case is going to be uh, around about three volts. But that voltage is going to go through this resistor to the output terminal. But the output terminal then gets connected to the negative terminal through this capacitor. And then it also goes through this resistance to this point here where we have a couple of really large capacitors and the negative terminal also goes through a resistance to these capacitors. And what this does 
is because a, an op amp tries to keep the voltage on all three of its terminals the same at all times, when these capacitors start charging up, it's going to change the voltage that, the, that is seen on the three terminals, and so the op amp is going to try to adjust to compensate for that. And so what ends up resulting at this point right here is that we get a time varying voltage that looks like a capacitor that charges and then discharges. It looks kind of like a logarithmic increase and then an exponential decay. And so it has, it, it looks sort of kind of triangle-ish, but a lot of classic effects use a, an LFO that has this kind of a shape. And it is kind of the sound of a lot of the classic circuits. So when we have that voltage kind of bouncing back and forth between the capacitors and our three op amp terminals, we can actually change the characteristics of that um, by changing this resistance right here. This speed potentiometer is set up as a variable resistor where at full uh, clockwise, the second lug is connected to the third lug, meaning there's zero resistance here. And when we turn it fully counterclockwise, we get the maximum resistance between lugs two and three because lugs two and one are connected. And so as we make this resistance small, meaning we turn the knob up, then we have less resistance coming through here, which means that our capacitors are going to charge and discharge faster. But if we turn the knob down, then what's going to happen is we have a larger resistance here, which means that our capacitors are going to charge and discharge slower. So it's going to give us a slower LFO speed, which means our modulation is going to be slower. And so once we have the output of that LFO, it's going to be a pretty large um, voltage right here. And we don't need a ton of voltage to make a nice pitch modulation here on pin two. So what we do is we have this potentiometer for depth as a variable resistor where maximum depth is shorting lugs two and three and minimum depth is having 500 K ohms of resistance in series with our 33 K ohm resistor here. So minimum depth is going to be 533 K ohms and maximum depth is going to be 33 K ohms. And so with that adjustment, we then change just how much voltage is going to make its way here onto pin two, which is going to change the strength of the pitch modulation um, of this PT2399 delay stage by changing the delay time more than at minimum depth. Because if you have a delayed signal and you're constantly varying its delay time, you get a pitch modulation out of it. Um, that is what happens with analog delays as well as using digital delay chips like the PT2399. There is this switch here for space slash warble. I haven't built the circuit with this switch, so I don't know exactly what that sounds like. But for the sake of our um, investigation of this circuit, we're just going to leave it alone. So there we have our chorus circuit. We take our signal in, we buffer and split it. It goes into a delay stage where we are using an LFO to modulate the delay time to get pitch modulation, which then gets combined with our dry signal and it goes out. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and subscribe so that you are notified of the next ones. We're going to continue on with some of the modulation driven effects um, and other LFO topologies in the following videos. So stay tuned and we'll see you then. Thanks.